Hi, everyone. My name's PK. Here I have Ben Canty with you. I'm super excited about this episode because, I mean, just this is not a lie. I know people think this is fake and everything, but Ben has bought seven properties. I'm reading here, seven properties in nine months. That was all in 2023. His total purchase or portfolio purchase price is $2,845,000. And the bank val across those different properties has come back at 3,323,000. So the, the difference is almost 500. I think it's 478K. So that's how much equity he has so far in, like I said, in nine months, seven properties in nine months. I'm going to introduce him in a second, but I just want to say in this episode, I, th I think you guys should stick around. Like you won't find this level of detail in any other place. We're going to go through you know, what his strategy was going in. Cause you know, he, he used to work in food retail. He worked at Kohl's. This is not a millionaire buying all these properties. This is a, a normal person. He's based in Melbourne. Why he bought so quickly, why, why the rush, how he managed to do that. Like, you know, it's not easy quote unquote to buy this many properties in a short period of time. We're going to go through how he's doing valuations real quick. We're going to go through his challenges. We're going to go through how he structured his loans, like the nitty gritty, the stuff I know you guys want to know what his borrowing power was to start with. What are the must have features in a property that he looks for, the entities that he bought in, how he refinanced if he did and how much all this costs to, to hold. So there's a lot to cover. I do hope we, uh, we go through everything but um ben like i was saying before you hit record super super grateful man like you're you're doing far better than <laughs> you're a client to the property you're you're my client i'm the teacher so to speak but you're doing far better than i did when i was nine months in so so big congratulations to, to everything you've achieved oh thanks so much for having me pk um it's a pleasure and an honor to be speaking with you and and hopefully i can add um a little bit of value as my journey has has been an interesting one <laughs> to say to say the least. Well, let, let's let's get going. Like, what was your before doing the course? What was your property experience? What's your background? Sure, PK. So um, you could say my property journey has been broken up into two parts. Um, the first part was a far longer journey, and and not a lot happened to be honest. It started in two thousand and nine, and I was I was twenty four back then, and I'd saved up eighty thousand dollars and and purchased the house and land package in Berwick. Uh, where I lived in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Three years later, using equity from my Berwick home, I purchased a second property in Pakenham, which is about 15 minutes from, from Berwick in the southeastern suburbs. And that property was a, a three bedroom unit on a 12 unit block. And, and that's it, first part done. So it's fair to say, PK, looking at my asset selection, you know, I didn't get off to a, a dream start in my, in my property journey. The thing was, at the time, I had no interest in property. Um, you know, I was brought up thinking more of the old school mentality, you know, work hard, grind, buy a house, live in it forever, then maybe buy another house just down the road so you can see if the tenants had mown the lawns. <laughs> um, old school property investing 101. But in hindsight, looking back at my time in my 20s, um, I think I'm underestimating, you know, my behaviours and, and decisions. Um, for a bit more context, I was raised in a middle income household, in a middle income suburb. My parents are together and, and are to this day. You know, we learned strong values and, and ethics and, and we also learned to live a risk averse and frugal life. You know, there was no fancy overseas holidays. There were no cars or boats in the driveway. Um, there were no credit cards. You know, mum and dad to this day don't have a debit card. So, you know, we learnt, we learnt the value of money, but more importantly for me at the time, we learnt the value of, of budgeting. And I guess you could say we lived within our means and, and we didn't really go for, for instant gratification. So we learned to be critical thinkers um, and, and debt was bad. Like debt was really bad back then. So this makes the second part of my journey a little bit more interesting. So the second part started February, 2022. I remember as clear as day, I was on annual leave from work. I'd been working in, in food retail for 20 years at that stage. And I was just sitting there and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> like, what am I doing? Can I do this until I'm 
70 years of age. And, you know, I'm like, no, absolutely not. Okay, so what am I actually going to do about it? So I typed Property Australia, property Investing Australia into YouTube and, and your name came up and, um, you know, I, PK, I binge watched your content like I was watching Game of Thrones and, and Breaking Bad. Like I binge watched like 100 episodes in, in two, three days. And what I really liked about your content was you're extremely genuine in how you, you put your content across um, and extremely knowledgeable. And what I also liked was you had gone through 10 years of blood, sweat and tears and worked all this out pretty much by yourself. So you were putting um, your own learnings forward um, and giving, giving everybody great education. So I'm like, you know, I've got to, I've got to hear more from this bloke. So I purchased your course in March, 2022. And, um, you know, my mind was, was instantly blown. You know, there was, there was light bulb moments every five minutes listening to the content, like even coming from a background of like mine, um, everything's made sense to me. So I had made up my mind after completing strategy week that I was going to get out of the nine till five at 45. So that was the end goal. That was the slogan. That was the end game. I wanted to have the choice at 45 years old, whether I worked or not, or whether I lived overseas or, or whether I could spend more time with my family. In order to do this, I needed to, to do a buy and hold strategy. And I needed to purchase 12 properties in four years. And at the end of the eighth year, sell seven, keep four, plus have one of my SMSF. So that means by the end of the eight years, I would have $3 million in debt-free property plus about $120,000 in passive income. So that was, that was certainly aggressive, um, absolutely. It was, it was only eight years away, and, um, but I think your content helped me build up the self-belief and, and realize it, it was possible. So I'll admit it was a pretty rocky 2022 for me uh, in terms of progress, I was finding it really difficult, you know, to, to work a full time job and and invest at the same time. It's crazy thinking back on this now, but, you know, my self confidence and self belief that I could do it by myself was so low that in November, I, I hired a buyer's agent. Um, and I purchased a property, they purchased the property for me at the very, very end of 2022. And I used my packet of equity to purchase that. And I had a good experience with them. You know, I think their asset selection was pretty good. In 2023, um, that's when things really changed for me. That's when things really started to heat up. I made a conscious decision to rewire my brain to believe I could achieve seven property portfolio by the end of 2023. It was a, a non-negotiable for me. It needed to be done. There was no ifs, buts or maybes. There was no second guessing you know, I needed to do this, you know, to get a step closer to being out of the nine to five at 45. I purchased another property at the end of March in Queensland using more equity for my berry comb. So, and I remember thinking I was on top of the world, you know, I did it, I purchased one by myself. You know, I can do this. I've got four properties, seven properties, here we come. I thought it was like a property guru. <laughs> and then I got stuck. So I couldn't borrow a cent more. I forgot about borrowing capacity. You know, my broker was like, Ben, mate, I love your aggression. I'm all for it. But you tapped out, mate. You know, interest rates have gone up 11 times the last 12 months and your income doesn't cover. Um, it doesn't look good for your serviceability. So at that stage, I was thinking, you know, what am I going to do? You know, I said I needed to have a seven property portfolio by the end of 2023. I've got to do it, so, so let's get to work. Um, and I remember that, that you taught that it was really, really important to get a, a, a really good team around you. Now, I would managed, managed to find a very, very good broker, but I never had really had a good accountant for, for pretty much all the years I've been alive. I saw a video of yours with uh, an accountant called Jeremy Idzinelli from KHI Partners. And he had 23 properties and I'm like, far out, this bloke, um, 
I've got to talk to this bloke. Yeah. So I reached out to him and, and told him my strategy. And I remember very, very clearly to this day, he was him saying so casually, so Ben, have you thought about selling your Melbourne properties? I'm like, what? You know, my risk averse and, and cautious um, brain were, were literally having a meltdown. I'm like, once I pick myself up the floor, I'm like, I thought about it and it made sense. It made sense to me because one, the value of my Berry property was more than double two Perth properties combined, but the rent I was getting from my Berry property was worth only one of the Perth properties. And two, the unit I purchased was a poorer performing asset. You know, and it was it was a, a poor poor yield and you know average capital growth. And you know, the research I had done in the past, I'm like, you know what, I can I can get a far better property interstate for less money that will give me better returns. So I certainly don't recommend this strategy to everybody, but this strategy completely fitted my goal. And I'd also learned from other successful property investors that sometimes you do need to rebalance your portfolio, especially if you do want to build a scalable one. I spoke to my broker about the idea and we actually mapped out a scenario. If I did sell my properties, what exactly would that look like? So I worked out what my properties would sell for minus tax and, and um, the expenses. And look, I just want to say that the profit of my Melbourne properties was, was nothing gigantic, you know? So the loans I had on my Melbourne properties were actually a lot more currently than when I started because of the equity I drew out right. to pay for those properties. So, you know, the, the unit I purchased had not even doubled in value. In 11 years, I had it. The Berry property had done okay. And to give you more context on my financial situation, so, so I'm, I'm a single man, um, no kids, but I am an average income earner. You know, for 20 years, I was on a five-figure salary wage. It was only the last two years that I just ticked over the six-figure mark. So my broker ran the numbers, and this is where the money habits and behaviours that were instilled in me and my youth really came to the fore and were beneficial. So, you know, I had no credit cards, I had no personal loans, no car loans, no hex debt, no PPOR, no outstanding payments, perfect credit score. So combining this with the profits from my Berwick and Pakenham properties, my broker said I could buy, I could buy enough for four properties in my own name and one in my SMSF. So, there was a few, there was a little bit of criteria that I needed to hit in order for the lenders to, to be satisfied. So 20% deposits, tier three lenders, the majority of the properties had to be around $400,000, not really much more. And the yields had to be, you know, around about five and a half percent minimum. Mm -hmm. So at risk of me talking for, for the next two hours, PK, I, I did it. I, I sold, sold my Melbourne properties in May last year and um, I purchased another three properties in Queensland and two properties in, in WA through a 10-week period through July, August, September last year and did it, seven properties by the end of 2023. So it's so crazy. I mean, I, I generally didn't know your income and... I think when when I posted your your deals and and your story on the Facebook group, um, everyone assumed that you were on a high income, and and so did I. To be honest, like I never asked your income before. I mean, for some reason, I expected it to be like three hundred thousand or something. But like this is, uh, it's kind of hard to believe. So, and I'm not saying it's false, but yeah. <laughs> it's kind of hard to believe you were on a five five figure income for twenty years. Um, it it just pipped the six figures. Yeah. Um, in the last two years so like this is is an average income whether you take the mean or median for australian people this is this is average and, and of course 
I think a lot of credit has to go to your folks for instilling those just, I would say, pure money habits um, that allowed you also to have that borrowing capacity. Um, just on that question, I want to ask two questions before we, we sort of carry on. One question is, have you told your parents your portfolio now and how much debt you have? And if you have, what's their reaction? <laughs> yeah, so, so yes, PK, um, um, they know, uh, they know. So it's interesting. Um, they had, in the last 10 years, um, they've, they've made a, a fairly decent portfolio for themselves. Um, so they understood the basics of, of property investing, but they certainly were a little bit apprehensive when I said, hey, you know, I'm not really buying 15 minutes down the road. I'm actually buying pretty much sight unseen, like 3,000 kilometers away in Bunbury and WA. So they were initially a little bit hesitant, mm -hmm. um, but they'd seen, I guess, all the hard work that I had put into myself, into my mindset firstly, but secondly, into the education, you know, the last two years or so. So they were confident that all that combined, um, that I'd make the right decision. Um, and it'd be a decision that benefited me, benefited me in the long run. So, okay. yeah. Right. So mindset plus knowledge is, is really what instilled the confidence, I suppose, in them, in you. Um, and the second question I had, because I thought it was, it was interesting, you did the course and then you went off and, and used a buyer's agent. And like, let's be honest about that. You did um, because you had some limiting beliefs. I think you mentioned yeah. what I'm interested in is you bought that one through a buyer's agent, that, but then you bought the preceding six by yourself using yeah. the course. How did you, what, like be, beyond just saying um, like it was a mindset thing, which obviously it was, could could you help me understand what you rewired in your brain? Like, what are those subconscious beliefs? Yes. I can guarantee there's going to be like thousands of people watching this on YouTube or listening to it on the podcast that have these exact issues. Yeah, sure. Of course, PK. So I've always struggled with self-doubt and, and self-confidence for, you know, most of my life. Um, I've always had a fear of failure, you know, doing the wrong thing, people judging me, um, judging my, you know, life compared to others. So, you know, and, and not re really believing I, I could do anything. So I came to the realization that, you know, I was just floating through life. I was comfortable, but I wasn't fulfilled. I wasn't adding value and I wasn't getting value. And how my mindset was at the time, was not going to change any of that. So I looked literally deep within myself and worked out that for life to, for my life to improve, changes need to be made and real. And I realized that one of the only things you can control in your life is your own mind. Understanding that there were thought patterns that I was thinking all the time that needed to change. Instead of the fixed mindset, meaning I'm born with my abilities and I can't really change them, I rewired my brain into the growth mindset, meaning with hard work, you can learn and you can improve. You know, with this, I created a more positive mindset. You know, when I was faced with obstacles and challenges, I said one word, good. My brother taught me that good, you know, because I understood that nothing of value is easy. You know, if it was, everybody would be doing it. Yeah. And doing this was the catalyst, you know, for my turnaround, um, realizing that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to fail because you're, you're only a real failure if you quit. So if you can just keep going and concentrate on the solution, then, you know, in time with all that practice, you know, you'll be better for it. Yeah. 
So that's how I, you know, change change my mindset. Yeah. I I can really tell that you've sort of you've sort of deeply contemplated and and thought about these things. Like you're coming across like very thoughtful and and like you're articulate. So I can I can see there's been a lot of inner work done. And I th I think property investing, as much as it's about strategy, sub selection, etc., it's actually about that inner work as well. I used to have a massive scarcity mindset. The way to get ahead is to save. Nothing wrong with saving, but now it's all about the way to get ahead is to earn more. Right. And and then you don't have to worry about like spending. And that's kind of where freedom comes from. Anyway, uh, I don't yeah. make this about me, but um, th th thanks for sharing. And so, you know, you were working that job and you found it tough to balance the both investing yes. and working in 2022. But in 2023, then you went off and bought six properties by yourself. Well, so like, how did you then why why the rush? Like, sure. why did you want to do it in such a fast period? And, and how did you manage to do it? Sure. So, PK, there was a couple of reasons um, for the speed. So, number one, so I purposely forced myself to take action to unlock my ability. You know, like ability is putting knowledge into action. It's so easy to sit back and overthink and overanalyze, procrastinate, ruminate. And it's so much harder to take action. So I needed to force myself to. You know, I had a, I remember I had a diary on my desk and I had an end date written in that diary of when I needed to buy the portfolio by. And every day I used to update the end date and, you know, also write some, some strong motivating words to, to keep me motivated and grounded. Um, and this made me completely accountable. What I also did was write down everything, you know, negative a person said about me um and you know and looked at it every single day i put it on the wall and, and looked at it every single day and pk it's crazy like I, I had people calling me psychopaths um because of what i'm trying to achieve and the mindset that i've taken on people calling me crazy um you know people laughing at me when i told them where i bought um people telling me not to buy there it's high crime rate there's a mortgage cliff interest rates have gone up, property market's going to crash. Um, you know, you're putting the rest of your life at in jeopardy and risk. So it was a part of mine to keep me focused. It was a part of mine for, I guess, short term motivation, because I'm, I'm more into discipline than motivation. But mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I wanted to I wanted to prove them wrong. You know, um, so the second, the second reason might be a little bit more of an interesting reason. I thought that was interesting, so, but I'll go on. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I resigned from my job um, at the end of June last year. Um, and the business was good enough to let me take the rest of my annual leave and long service leave before my official resignation date. So I had three months before um, before starting my own business. And we all know that if, if you're trying to get a loan and you're kind of just starting a new business or you're unemployed, that the banks or the lenders don't really like that. <laughs> so that was the added, added motivation I needed to purchase before a set date, right. before you know I ran into a, a little bit of trouble. Um, but, but I guess what I'd like to say is, I know the property acquisitions were very, very quick, um, but there was, you know, I'd purchased your course almost two years ago. Um, I'd done your course three times, PK. I, I would have taken a couple of months in annual leave to actually do your course. Wow. Um, you know, I put months and months and months into researching, educating, um, you know, learning how to, negotiate being active in markets um building relationships so you know in in me spending so long doing that that gave me the ability to to buy in such a short period of time because i had all the i had everything ready to go i was primed to uh to do it so yeah uh, i i like i like that answer a lot it it just tells me that how there's so many different types of people and one thing that struck out at me was like 
you know, the people around you that were telling you, you know, that you're, you shouldn't do this or, or what about the mortgage cliff? And it, I think for, for some of us who have been in the property industry for a relatively longer time, we kind of understand that these cliffs don't actually eventuate being cliffs or, you know, all this media headlines ends up fizzling out. Uh, and I try to demonstrate using data and, and everything like that. But I think if you're new, like you were, like that, that's a very genuine worry. And and if you have a friend or colleague or family circle or acquaintance circle who actually buy into that mainstream media, um, like sort of nonsense, if I can use the word, then it, it's actually quite terrifying. So I think credit to you, I, I can't, I think I need to appreciate that more of how much of a leap of faith it takes for, for a new person to overcome that noise. Um, so, yeah, I mean, goals are potent for sure, but I think ignoring that that noise and, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever, I get so much hate, as you can imagine, having a 100,000 <laughs> um, person community across different platforms. I don't think I would ever put that on a wall, but kudos, kudos <laughs> to you for, um, for, for doing that. And... It also teaches me that there's different types of people, like some people do the course whilst having, you know, family in a nine to five and, and they do it, you know, a few hours every week and buy after one or two months and others need to because of their mindset or because of their yeah. background or because of a desire, they, they want to or need to do it multiple times and then just block you know, not do it on the side, but just block a, a couple of weeks or in your case, months to buy, well, six properties. That's a lot of properties. But yeah, that, that, that thank you for the, thank you for answering that. And what uh, this, hopefully this doesn't seem like an interrogation, but I have so many questions to get through. Um, what kind of loan structuring did you use? Uh, you know, you mentioned you used 30 lenders and I noticed that you never once went to your broker and said, what's the best interest rate I get? I can get. And that's what most people do. You asked more about how can I make this long-term strategy work? But what, like, did you go with different banks that you, they're all third tier? Just talk to, talk to me about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so PK, they are all tier three lenders um, at the start. So I've, my broker's managed to refinance my first two loans to tier one lenders um, because of the equity um, I had. Um, so, but yeah, five at the moment are with tier three lenders. And look, I wouldn't be sitting here today if if I didn't go with tier three lenders. I know that some people are, are scared of tier three lenders um, and, and they just want to go to tier one lenders. Um, but I certainly wasn't from that mindset. Um, I, I think they're, they're quite valuable to go through. Um, and I think that in the future, you know, I know that I will be able to refinance to a tier one lender at a better rate in the future because of my income, because of the equity I, I make. And so I'm not going to be with them forever. So I certainly wouldn't discourage people for, from using tier three lenders. Um, and yes, so, so tier three lenders, 20% deposits, um, and they were from, I think I, I get, I had two with first Mac and then spread across other, um, lenders like VMG, um, pepper money, um, and a couple of others. So, so yeah, I, my broker didn't even bother looking at, at tier one lenders. I'm sure he just went to, <laughs> he just straight went to straight to, to three tier lenders. Yeah. Right. And and even the third tier lenders, they know that, like they create their products in such a way that, you know, they're attracting people who they know will refinance out in, a, in one or two years. It's it's a win win mm. situation. Yes. Like what what's a what's an average interest rate that you're paying right now with a third tier lender? Yeah. So my my interest rate, it, it is a little high. So my interest rate average across the whole portfolio is 7.8 is percent. Mm -hmm. So I'm paying about 6.75 in tier ones and mm -hmm. about uh, about just under 8% in tier threes currently. Right. Um, but for me, PK, you know, um, property is, is a long term term game. So I'm not thinking short term. I, I'm quite confident that in two years time, um, you know, my property properties will be two and a half thousand dollars positive um, each property at the moment my holding costs are um, negative four and a half thousand dollars per property after tax um, but I believe that in two years time 
with interest rates um, slowly decreasing, plus rents going up as they are, um, I've worked it out. There'll be a fifty thousand dollar turnaround in my in my cash flow. Mm. So, you know, I think that I guess I don't really look at the now. I know, and I have buffers in place, and I know that the next year or two will be difficult. Um, but I can see, I can see the end, and and I can see that if I just hold it for two years, you know, everything will turn around. And I think, um, you know. Some people do struggle with that, um, but you know, believe me. Like, yeah, I, I don't love that I'm in, in thirty thousand dollars debt after tax, but it'll be worth it in the end. And and that means, um, and that's still with the portfolio making over three hundred thousand dollars a year in in equity. Yeah. So so yeah, um, don't worry about the short term. If you can get through it, it'll be fine in the long term. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, of course everyone's different and if you can't afford that four thousand dollars per property then you know maybe you need to buy a higher yielding property that that doesn't cost four thousand or just not buy at all like you know it's not a case of just buy property all the time but if you have a cohesive well thought through long-term strategy like um like you do ben then well, what to speak of two years like five years ten years i mean it's already got half a million dollars of of equity for 78 you know, yeah. it's gonna that's gonna go up, but you know, what's the point of net wealth if you don't have cash flow? But then that will then convert into cash flow, as you mentioned earlier. You'll sell down perhaps a few properties and use that profit to pay down the debt, and then you'll have a yeah. less encumbered portfolio. This is this is not so, rocket science. It's not something that's unique to my students. It's just what people have been doing in Australia for like decades and and decades and decades. So I think that's a really cool education piece. Um, Thanks, thanks for sharing that. And what sort of ownership structures? I know you do. You mentioned one is an SMSF. Um, are sure. There, are, are there properties are are they personal name? Are they in trusts? Or I mean, you don't have to go into too much personal information if you don't want to. But just yeah. At level. Yeah, sure, PK. So I've got six properties in my own name, and and one in an SMSF. So I've done a little bit of work on, I guess, trusts and and, and that kind of thing. Um, with my broker and obviously each situation is different and I'm sure trusts are highly beneficial for, for quite a lot of people. But for my strategy, um, my broker was only able to get two properties instead of four in trusts. So it cut down my portfolio by, by two properties if I wanted to go through trusts. So um, yeah, just a, just a tip for anybody out there, um, you know, trust would be great, but it might not exactly fit your strategy. Yeah. And I remember when I did that video with Jeremy, the accountant that you use, we actually talked about trust and how they can improve your borrowing capacity. But here's a perfect example of it actually not being the right solution for every single person's situation. And in fact, that's what I've, I've got. I am a bit messy. I've got properties, my name, wife's name, you know, company structures, trust structures, etc. Um, if I had known what I do now, I probably would have made it simpler. But yeah, the simpler you can make it um, and and maximize your borrowing capacity, the extent that you, which you can, that I think that's the best. That's that's the best way to go. Um, and have you like I, I know that you've bought all of them within a year or within a, a matter of months, really? Have you already refinanced some to take equity out? Like, was was it all all of those deposits using cash, or was it some using equity? Yeah, so so the first two properties I bought were was from equity from my um, my Melbourne properties when I had them, but the last five, no, no. So so uh, it was it was certainly too it was too soon to to borrow any equity. But yeah. lucky enough, I did have the cash from my Melbourne properties. Um, yeah, to put on to put on four twenty percent deposits plus costs. Um, and I, I just had enough in my SMSF to buy one more property. So, yeah, I mean, certainly not complicated. Um, I guess, you know, lesson, lesson learned for anybody out there that's, that's young or in their twenties is, you know, if, if you, if you want to get into the property game and get in, just get in, in your twenties, <laughs> yeah. <It> just, <laughs> um, cause that's completely paid off, paid off for me. So. 
yeah, you know, um, get him while get him while you're young if you can. Nice, nice, and and we'll, we'll sort of talk about what you're you're doing, what you're passionate about in in a second. But I just want to ask as well, um, what's like, you know, buying in Queensland. Some of, of course I know where you've bought. Yeah. Buying in in Perth, I think everyone knows it's not a, a walk in the park to buy in Perth right now of course i teach these things in the course but what's like one or two pieces of advice that you can share ben um for people who are perhaps like struggling and they're like oh my god i can't even get agents to call me back oh my god like everything is already under offer when i go online on real estate or domain um you know emotional owner occupiers are overpaying hundred thousand dollars for properties like it's impossible to buy in perth and and i i empathize with them because Perth has this kind of unique situation at the moment. Yes, demand is high, but it's not super high. The real problem is supply is the lowest it's ever been in Perth, and it's the lowest anywhere in Australia. Uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it's like the lowest any capital city has ever been right now. It's a <laughs> supply problem. How did you yeah. overcome this? Not just to like fluke one property, but like six properties by yourself. It's a good question, PK. Um and and I, I get it it's hard like it is hard buying in perth wow um what i what i did was i learned to enjoy the process so i know i talk a little bit about the outcome here but i really learned to enjoy the process of buying property um and the only way you can enjoy the process is be active in the market really be amongst the thick of things You'll be amazed how much you can learn if you're really active in the market. And what do I mean by active? So I mean, understanding your three or four suburbs that you want to buy in down to a, a really, a really uh, deep level. So put offers on property. It's okay if you miss out, you'll be amazed on, on you know, how much you can learn just by putting offers on property and missing out. You'll quickly notice that your, your, your mind will adapt to, to the market. It'll adapt to you missing out on properties. As long as you don't get down on yourself and you think, oh, okay, I missed out on that property, but that's okay because I learned that I missed out by $10,000 on that property. I'm going to hire a little bit. I'm going to put an offer on a little bit higher next time or I was going to put an offer on that bought that property, but I missed out by one day because I wasn't quick enough. I waited to the open home, for example. So yeah, the more time you spend in the market, the more you will adapt to that market. Um, and yes, it is, it is challenging when agents don't call you back. It's challenging when they, they don't even respond to the offers you put in. <laughs> um, all I can say is, like you only need one, like you only need one agent. There's thousands in WA. You only need to call and speak to an agent that has a little bit more time for you. Um, and, and you might get along with quite naturally and he or she might send you that pre-market opportunity before it goes on to, on to market. So, it is challenging building relationships with agents in hot markets. I know I've been there. I've done that. But if you can just find one, that can be the difference for you to buy a property. Yeah. 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 I think that's, that's very, very true. And, and in my experience as well, nothing can replace picking up the phone. I think people are scared to picking, to pick up the phone and sometimes they'll pay $15,000 for another person to pick up the phone for them instead um, not to say that that's, that's uh, what they're doing is bad, but you yeah. can pick up the phone and it's, you're not selling anything. It's not like cold calling. You know, you, you have to speak with agents. Hey, I'm, I'm looking for this type of property. I noticed that you had a few sold um, recently. If something comes up, please let me know. Yes, there might be other people doing the same. Yeah, right. But if you if you can just develop a rapport, if you can be nice, if you can be professional, if you can say, I've got my pre uh, approval ready i can send that to you i'm ready to go then that agent is is going to send you deals maybe not that agent i should say another agent maybe do that four times five times six times maybe do that 
two times a week, maybe do that over two or three weeks, you're going to get some success. It just takes one or two agents to come through. And I think, you know, we didn't go through your individual properties, Ben, because we don't have time, but you've got things that are off market, pre-market. You've got things that are under market value. Your properties have gone up really fast. The yields are, you know, not just above five and a half percent, but above six percent, um, seven percent in some instances. And and you've been able to do this yourself and you haven't, maybe this is incorrect and let me know if it is, but you're in Melbourne, like you didn't fly to Perth, did you? You didn't fly to regional Queensland or anything, did you? So... Um. <laughs> no, absolutely not, PK. Um, I haven't seen, I haven't seen any of my properties. I haven't walked yeah. into any of them at all. Um, so yeah, I mean, learning the skills to buy into state, you know, is an absolute game changer. Um, especially if you're in Melbourne, Sydney, um, because that opens up like countless opportunities for you. Um, and you know, if you're thinking about buying in Melbourne and Sydney, and you, like you want, you might want to buy a million dollar apartment because you want to invest there. You know, data doesn't lie. This is what I say to myself all the time. Data doesn't lie and data doesn't care about your feelings. It's, it's just there, it's just the data. So a property in your hometown may not be the best interest for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I found that, I actually found it a little bit better um, not buying in my hometown or not seeing a property because, you know, You've, you've sort of got an emotional connection to a, a property or a suburb if you know it or if you've been into it. So the thing is, you're not buying in it to live in it. So, you know, you're so visiting the property is not generally going to go well for you. Um, you know, so you'll pick it apart and, and be real negative and find out so many reasons why not to buy the property when you probably should. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for people, scared of buying into state there's heaps of good people into state that will help you you know um there's good sales agents there's good property managers which are extremely important there's good conveyances there's good building and pest inspectors like all those people you've got on the ground you just need to do a little bit of due diligence and research online and, and you can find them and, and they will do the job for you right right um, two last questions because I'm just mindful of time. Um, I have to ask this and, uh, uh, you know, it's not intended to be a sales and marketing thing, but I have to ask anyway. Um, for, for someone who's perhaps uh, maybe like you, you know, like you were lacking confidence, you're not from a um, an entrepreneurial background, you're not from a, a abundance mindset or growth mindset background, you you want to buy into state, you recognize your existing assets are perhaps not performing as well. You jump onto YouTube or other platforms and you see people making money or you, you watch this interview with, with Ben or whoever, and you're like, you know, I can, I think real estate is for me, but I just don't know how to do it. I don't know if I can do a course online. I don't trust myself. Like, what would you say to those people perhaps on the fence about doing the the course, the property investment accelerator about getting the mentorship, because I think you're a good case study. You know, you, you did the course, um, but then you still had to overcome a lot of challenges. So, so what would you say to those people kind of on the fence? Well, if you are sitting on the fence, um, I think you need to, you need to think about three or four things. So you actually need to get a couple of things, you know, right before before you jump into to education. And that and that is number one is mindset. So mindset number one thing for me, it really was. So, you know, you need to believe in yourself. Um, you need to have unwavering self confidence in your ability to do this. If you want to build a property portfolio, it's unusual, it's against the norm, you know, 0.08% of people in Australia have six or more properties. 99% of people do not reach financial freedom. It is unusual. So you need to be comfortable with that. And your mindset needs to be retrained from seeking pleasure and comfort, which is a natural human emotion, a human need to seeking uncomfortableness and suffering to a certain point. Um, and you need to be comfortable with that. You need to be ready for that. So I think number two, strategy. So before you get heaps and heaps of education, have a think about why you are actually thinking about doing this. So 
Is it for yourself? Is it for your family? Um, is it to have more choice? Is it financial freedom? Why are you actually doing it? The second thing is what your end goal looks like, which is really important to me. Is it $60,000 passive income in 15 years? Is it two properties paid off in 20 years? What, are you, what is it? Third would be how you're going to do it. And PK will, will show you this in the course. So is it a consistent buy and hold? Is it a front loaded buy and hold like I did? <laughs> um, do you have equity in your PPOR? Do you have equity in your other investment properties? Um, without a strategy, you are lost. So they're the probably two things, PK, in regards to the course. Um, honestly, it, it's been life changing for me, completely life changing. Um, you know, I have um, made it in, into a full time job now, thanks to PK's education um, and the course that that he puts together. Um, I I'd highly doubt that there is a, a better course for anybody thinking about investing in in property and in real estate I, I i highly doubt that there is so you know guys if you're on the fence like just just do it just do it i think there was one cool thing that you said earlier as well thank you by the way for that um you're not there by yourself like it's not just me either there there are terrific property managers building in mortgage brokers conveyances like you get that team in the course and you don't you don't have to use that team like i think ben you know some of the people that you use i didn't give you you know you you actually went out and did your own due diligence and and found them so, all right guys so just to just to finish off i hope you got a, a ton of value from this and as you can see there's a whole bunch of papers behind ben on on the wall so that's all <laughs> he's like a very visual person as am i he's actually like done all the analysis and like written it up based on what he's learned in the course. So that's kind of like his war room. And you can tell he's super passionate about it. There are lots of people who do the course that get a lot of great results. And then like, it's just human nature. If you become really good at something, then they want to pass that on. There's more than 75 buyers agents that it's not that they did the course to become a buyers agent explicitly, but they just got such success that they turned it into a, a part-time or full-time sort of gig. And, and I think it's really heartening to see people who have got success themselves go about trying to help others in an ethical way. Okay. And I think, you know, strategy is, is amazing. Data is amazing. Tactics are amazing, etc. But ethics, without ethics, everything else falls over. So I think it, this industry needs more and more people with a solid basis of ethics and i don't think you can teach that i think that comes from comes from within from your own personal experiences and then as we can see ben's gone on a or well, been on a really really transformative journey from you know his kind of background with the money habits that he had to, to now where he's landed himself you know proven his um criticizers or, or or people have opposed him wrong of course that's not been his only motivation but he's just kicked goals and and like i said at the start He's achieved more in nine months than I did in probably my first five years. And I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm very proud to say that. Um, so big, big congratulations, Ben, for, for everything you've achieved. I think this, this episode and interview, hopefully it brings a ton of, of value. I think it will. And we went into a lot of detail here. Um, before we, we finish, is there anything else or last tips or anything else that you wanted to share? Um, I just want to say... Thanks, a big thanks to you, PK, again, for, for the course that you've put together. Absolutely amazing, absolutely life-changing. And I know that many, many hundreds of other um, students think the same way. Um, your content has, has certainly been inspiring and, and motivational for me and a lot of others. So, so, so no, PK, um, you know, I just wanna, and I also wanna say that, you know, I know that there'll be thousands of people out there watching that were in the same position I was. So, you know, I think if you believe, you, you need to believe in yourself um, because if I can do it, you guys can do it too. You know, just work a little bit on your mindset um, and, and everything will come. But yeah, like you're not alone. Um, and, I, you know, I really wish everyone all the best. And hopefully um, that was just a little bit of value for the, for the guys out there. 
No, absolutely. I'm sure they're very grateful um, on behalf of everyone. Thank you so much, Ben. And 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 guys, I, I'll tag Ben in the Facebook group when I post this. And if you want to reach out to him and ask questions about his portfolio or how he did it or sort of tips and techniques or tricks and stuff. I mean, he's obviously, um, you know, not at the beach doing nothing all day, but I'm sure he'll try to respond and help you out um, as much as possible. And, and I think lastly, I always say this, but there's like more than a hundred of these client interviews on the client results playlist on YouTube. And I always say like, honestly, Honestly, I'm I'm not in that in that period anymore. You don't have to do the course, right? I don't care if you do the course, but go and watch those interviews because by watching them, you'll get so much inspiration, just like Ben's provided today, and so much education that it will really shift your mindset and also shift your knowledge set so you can achieve great results. So I really implore you to do that. There's yeah, I, I, I'm trying to build a, a community that that kind of, you know, grows based on its own success. And I think um, Ben's a, a great product of that. And I'm very grateful to have him uh, as a, a client and student. Um, thanks, everyone, for watching. Hit the subscribe button, give it a like. And thank you once again, Ben. Thanks, PK.